What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out Podcast. This is a probably one of the most brutal episodes we've ever, ever done. Yeah, this is a brutal one. Today, we're covering an individual named Richard Chase. He was nicknamed the Vampire of Sacramento. It's believed that at some point he consulted a psychiatrist and he was told that the root of his problem was either repressed rage or mental illness. Torturing and killing animals is one of the three signs of a serial killer. The other two are wetting the bed and arson. There happened to be a rabbit farm that was pretty close to where Richard lived. He would often sneak in, kill the rabbits, and then drink their blood. This guy isn't anything but normal. Wayne Irie later admitted that if he had found the baby at Richard's property, he would have shot and killed Richard on the spot. Lights Out, everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Lights Out podcast. I'm your host, Josh, joined in the studio by my co-host, Austin. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm trying to prepare myself for this one. Yeah, this is a brutal one. This is a, probably one of the most brutal episodes we've ever, ever done, which is saying a lot, considering we've covered some terrible people, yeah. And he, he's right up there with some of the worst. But uh, also in the studio is our producer, Daniel. What's up, man? What's up, guys? So today we're covering an individual named Richard Chase. He was nicknamed the Vampire of Sacramento, which I think whenever you name somebody the Vampire of something, that should tell you right there that there's, there's blood involved. And this one is... Uh, very very disturbing he is a demented sick individual and just forewarning everything evil that somebody can do this guy did it to animals to humans you name it this guy has done it so if you have a weak stomach you know you might want to think twice about this one this one is uh this one honestly made me feel very very sick yeah, this is not Looking a lunch into. break episode here. Yeah, I mean, kudos to you if you're able to get through lunch and watch this, because, yeah, this is just this is going to leave you physically ill. But on a more lighter note, we are entering October. It's officially spooky season here in the world, and we've got some really great content scheduled for this month. I'm really excited to hopefully bring some some different stuff. We've got a really great Halloween episode planned. I think you're going to enjoy it quite a bit. I know we're going to have a lot of fun with it. But yeah, it's the official official month for Lights Out here. October fall is in the air. But let's just go ahead and jump right into things here. Ugh. I'm like I'm like having a hard time even thinking about all the things I'm about to tell you because it is just it's that bad. So this is the the story of Richard Trenton Chase and he was born on May 23rd 1950 in Santa Clara California he was born into somewhat of a quote unquote normal family I use that term very loosely because this guy's anything but normal but again there, it's sometimes hard with especially some of these older cases to to really dig up you know what their their childhood was like I mean a lot of it's never disclosed to the public so it's just what we were able to find through our research but in the 1950s, obviously different time, different parenting styles, and physical abuse was a very common form of punishment. But in Richard's household, there was most likely no severe physical abuse beyond the cultural norm, which was like spanking yeah, and hitting, I don't know, like taking a ruler, smack, 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 yeah, belt your dad, or something. Yeah, he hits you every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Just take a, <laughs> take a fist to the face a few times a month, but... From the outside, Richard seemed like a normal little boy. He was in Boy Scouts, played Little League Baseball. At home, though, his parents were very argumentative and strict, especially his father. And his parents soon separated for a short period of time before reconciling their marriage and moving down to Sacramento. All the while, Richard's behavior, as time went on, just became more and more disturbing. By the time he was 10 years old, his mother discovered a dead cat in her flower bed that Richard had tortured and killed. 
for a lot of you listeners out there, that is a big red flag, right? And we've touched on the dark triad before in previous episodes, like our serial killer episode. Um, Torturing and killing animals is one of the three signs of a serial killer, um, at least as far as that theory goes. The other two are wetting the bed and arson. Some reports do claim that Richard was lighting fires, small fires around this time. I couldn't really find any solid sources. And then as far as wetting the bed, who I, knows? Uh, yeah, who knows about that? But torturing and killing animals is a big sign for early killers. Um, and normally it's because children develop a conscience as they get older. And I remember when I was a little kid, maybe four or five, I pinched a dog's ears a bit too hard. And, you know, the dog yelps and that teaches you, oh, you can sympathize with this animal right. that you just hurt don't do that anymore right so like we were saying we use the word normal but maybe a uh, neurotypical neuronormative uh, people when they react to hurting an animal like that they will then learn to not do it anymore whereas someone who continues to torture and harm animals like this it's a sign that they're not developing the same way yeah it's major major alarms going off i mean at 10 years old to be killing a cat yeah that's very serious i mean it's just it's hard to even fathom a 10 year old killing a cat yeah that's a very early indication that something is wrong and richard was very much obsessed with killing cats he would literally just go through the neighborhood and you know this is isn't quite as common today people you know let their cats roam around outside and and you know they're kind of inside outside cats my cats are all inside cats i don't let them outside sometimes they find their way outside but then they come running back in as soon as the door closes they're like right back at the door like let me in okay yeah thank god because i'm not worried about kids ro roaming around killing my cats but i'm worried about the coyotes roaming around i lived in hamtramck um there was kind of a known thing that the neighborhood took care of all these alley cats because it kept the rodent population mm. down so just all of these neighborhoods blocks and blocks we had a ton of alley cats they, and they had seen some shit they had like the scarred eyes and like missing legs and oh stuff. wow so shit they were rough and tough but we did have problems with that in the community people poisoning cats and killing them and stuff oh wow yeah just because so, they're like they don't like them i yeah who knows or like their cats are fucking up their property or digging and stuff or yeah shitting on I mean, their they lungs. mostly kept to the to the alleyways but if they found a place to stay they'd definitely come back and return every night so you can imagine Richard, he's out there just walking through the neighborhood and at every opportunity he gets, he's he's killing one of the neighborhood cats. At Mira Loma High School, he blended in during his teen years. He dressed how the other boys dressed and he got the same haircut as his friends. But at some point, Richard began experimenting with marijuana and LSD and drugs. And he quickly, you know, a lot of teenagers try drugs and, you know, smoking weed, whatever, LSD, I mean, most of us have tried that as well, but he began to abuse these in extremely heavy doses. So obviously it did something for him. He liked the way that it made him feel. Maybe it kind of, I don't know. Those are some, those are both interesting to me, especially when it comes to Richard. But I, I do kind of wonder why, why those two and not others. Maybe that's what was just readily available. And yeah, maybe he was, I don't know, trying to suppress something or. Yeah. I mean, they're both like definitely kind of get you out of your normal headspace for right. sure so may, i wonder if it made him feel better or if it made him w almost worse yeah and like hyper focus on on these dark tendencies that he had yeah. or if it was kind of like an escape from that's what i the was inner thinking. demons possibly an escape but maybe it backfired mm. because of the abuse over time or something well, yeah i mean especially if you keep upping the doses you can definitely get to that panic state where the anxiety sets in and could actually amplify those things Forensic psychologist Dr. Helen Morrison believes that Richard had an underlying mental illness from an early age that was possibly amplified by this drug use. Alongside the drug abuse, he developed some other physical problems. Richard was a good-looking guy in high school and had a handful of girlfriends, but he could never maintain a steady and healthy relationship. And part of the problem with that was he couldn't achieve or maintain an erection. So I mean, he's a young man at this point, and he's already sounds like he's suffering from erectile dysfunction which is kind of weird 
Even though he was attracted to women, he wasn't sexually excited by them. It's believed that at some point he consulted a psychiatrist and he was told that the root of his problem was either repressed rage or mental illness. Supposedly, he had never followed up with the doctor and he never searched for more treatment after his diagnosis. Other reports claim that doctors thought he was perfectly healthy at the time, but Richard quickly realized that he could only be aroused and achieve orgasm through violent acts like torturing and killing animals. There happened to be a rabbit farm that was pretty close to where Richard lived, and he would often sneak in, kill the rabbits, and then drink their blood. And he justified this by telling himself that he had a quote-unquote weak heart, and that somehow drinking their blood would heal him. And I wonder if that is, I don't know, not to get... I guess we're going to get graphic in this episode, but there is a theory that, you know, to get an erection, blood flows into the organ, right? Mm. So maybe he just started connecting these strange dots between blood, consuming blood, and it somehow fixing that problem. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely was a part of his thought process. Mind you, it makes no sense whatsoever, but yeah. it's just, it's, I, I wish I could like, understand how he got to this point like what was it that just like sent him down this direction right because it seems like he was like born this way and this was just kind of in his genetic code to to be like this but maybe there's something else that we don't know that led him down this path but it is very it's just very disturbing to think about by the time he was in his 20s his behavior only got stranger He'd place oranges on his head and believe that the vitamin C could be absorbed into his brain by diffusion. He also became very paranoid and he thought he was going to be poisoned. He also developed severe hypochondria, which is basically being excessively worried about having serious illnesses. He thought he had bones moving and growing out of the back of his skull, which caused him to shave his head so he could watch them move. He also believed his stomach had turned upside down, and one time he accused a hospital of stealing his pulmonary artery. It's just like, what? None of this makes sense. Yeah, clearly mentally ill. At times, he was also in immense chronic pain, but this was all in his head. But since he believed that the pain was real, he tried to find a solution to it. And he believed that if he kept killing small animals, drinking their blood, and eating their body parts, this would eventually heal him. On April 28th, 1976, 25-year-old Richard was committed to Beverly Manor Psychiatric Hospital after he had injected a rabbit's blood into his veins and he actually got a blood infection. And this is kind of fucked up, but the staff there quickly named him Dracula. Kind of like for medical staff to be nicknamed, I don't know. I guess maybe dark humor helps you get through some of the weirder stuff, but... But I guess when he's doing things like this, I can maybe understand. Yeah. So he was involuntarily committed to the institution. And while he was there, he'd be in his room and he'd have his window open and he'd actually catch birds through it, twist their heads off and then drink their blood. That's just, that's just mind boggling. He also stole syringes from the hospital and extracted blood from the therapy dogs and during his treatment, he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and was given psychotic drugs like Thorazine until he was deemed no longer a danger to society. But after his stay at the institution, he clearly wasn't any better. I guess they were just like, as long as he stays on his meds, he should be, you know, he should get better. But obviously this is something that he's gonna suffer with his entire life. Some of the staff disagreed with releasing him, but he was discharged on September 29th after spending five months at this facility. His parents, who are now separated again, decided to put him into an apartment in Sacramento. After only nine months back in the real world, he began to capture, torture, and kill all sorts of animals again, like rabbits, dogs, and cats. Sometimes he even killed and ate the neighbor's pets. And once, he contacted a neighbor by phone and explained what he had done, which I couldn't imagine getting that phone call. Like, hey, yeah, capture your dog and killed it and ate it. How do you feel about that? That's just terrifying. Another thing that's out there, and I don't know if this is 100% true or not, is that he would make these like bloody smoothies. This, yeah. 
He'd like blend up the body parts and like drink it. You've heard correct. Yeah, that is the theory. He would mix it with Coke, Coca Cola. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah, he got creative with finding out ways to consume them. And it's, it's, that's also a good point to mention is that now it's no longer about blood. He's now consuming the these organs animals. and everything yeah. else. Yeah. So it's clearly escalating. So while he's making these uh, bloody smoothies, He's also going out and purchasing some firearms. He started practicing shooting them at the range. It was also around this time that he began reading about the crimes of the Hillside Stranglers pretty obsessively. So the Hillside Stranglers were these two men who murdered people in LA between October 1977 and February 1978. At first it was just, they thought it was one guy, but then they found out it was two. Many of their victims' bodies were discovered in the hills that surrounded the city, and the two men were later convicted of kidnapping, raping, torturing, and murdering 10 women and girls between the ages of 12 and 28. Um, and around the same time, so I mean, obviously, it's like Richard is now, not only is he escalating with consuming animals, now he's looking at murders. He's kind of consuming that, and so... Seems like he's fully leaning into this dark darkness that is within him, yeah. and he's becoming more and more interested in it, which obviously escalates over time. Yeah, but he's also into conspiracies. It sounds like yeah. So um, a lot of people think this is tying into his paranoia from his schizophrenia, but he started to get uh, into the Nazi UFO conspiracy theories, which I know, I think, you know, a little bit about that, right? The UFO ones. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's probably others that I don't know about, but the Nazi UFO conspiracy from the way that I understand it, is that, you know, during the world wars or world war two, the Nazis were abducting scientists and developing this anti-gravity technology, essentially creating their own flying saucers. There's actually a, I think there is a picture of the Nazi bell craft. If you if you look at that, it kind of looks like a very antiquated sort of UFO flying saucer as craft. They were dead, and and I do believe they were really interested in this. I mean, they were they were very much into the occult and kind of the paranormal and and really trying to figure out other ways to tap into sort of these unseen forces and to be able to obviously elevate their stance in the war and. And UFOs were one of them that they were very inter interested in. And there's obviously part of this theory too is that they they had a, a base down in Antarctica where they were developing these these flying saucers. But the interesting thing with Richard, right, is he kind of took it a step further. I didn't heard this before, but he believed he was like a test subject for this program or something, or that he was abducted by Nazis. And he, he as far as I could understand, what he was hung up on is that. He thought they were somehow tracking him and they would they would threaten to kill him. Somehow they were telepathically speaking to him hmm. and they threatened to kill him if he didn't obey them. Interesting. Yeah. That sounds like a product of schizophrenia. Yeah. And I know around this time, uh, the 60s and 70s, it was popular to publish books and theories about the Nazi UFO conspiracy theory. So who knows? Maybe he just started coming across that material more often and it made him more paranoid or something like that. I mean, it's very easy to see how anything he reads gets warped by his mind. Right. And yeah, so so you're probably able to picture this guy. I mean, he's he's completely out of his mind. He's paranoid. He's killing animals. He's drinking blood. And he's also just completely stopped taking care of himself. I mean, if you look at the photos of him in high school, as opposed to like his mugshot photos and some of his photos later on, it's like a, he just looks like a ghost of himself. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's like a strapping young lad in high school. And then he's just, his eyes are kind of like, it's like, he's not even looking he at just things looks and his hair is all disheveled and stuff. So Richard stopped bathing. He stopped grooming and he stopped brushing his teeth. At one point he even stopped eating and dropped to 145 pounds. One day in 1977, Richard showed up at his mother's house and rang the doorbell. And when she answered the door, she saw Richard holding a dead cat in his arms. He then threw the cat on the ground, knelt down next to it, literally right in front of his mom, ripped its stomach open with his bare hands. He then stuck his hand inside the cat and smeared blood all over his face and neck while screaming. 
His mother slammed the door shut and refused to let him come to the house ever again. She never reported this incident to police though. So his mother absolutely has responsibility in his actions because he should have been reported to the police that day. It sounds and like probably a number of other times. Yeah. It just sounds like both his parents checked out. They, and like after the psychiatry thing, you know, there's probably a lot of stigma around it. They didn't know what to do. And they just like, sounds like they just checked out, mm -hmm. let him, let him, they got him his little apartment and they were like, we, you're, you're kind of a grown man now. So we don't want anything to do with you. And they gave up, I think. Just like get away from me. Yeah. Meanwhile, your son is a danger to society and, yeah. and you have responsibility. He's clearly mentally ill. Yeah, I couldn't imagine just giving up like, what? like that. Yeah. And I know I yeah, I don't know. I know we we feel in twenty twenty three we see psychiatric yeah. treatment a bit differently than they did, you know, back then. But still I I don't think you have much of an excuse if, if your son is coming to your doorstep and shredding a, a cat in front of you and you're just saying, Don't come back and closing the door. It sounds like you're just call his out. doctor even like yeah call the facility he was just at and be like hey he's doing it again right bring him back in yeah so it's this ignorance by his his mother that really just fuels the fire really i mean he just he's he's shredding cats on doorsteps and eventually that's not going to be enough right he's going to need to take it to the next level Today's episode of Lights Out is brought to us by Every Plate which is now owned by HelloFresh which is a leading meal kit company if you're like me, you like to budget your food, you get more bang for your bite with America's best value meal kit. Every plate is 25% cheaper than grocery stores and they have no hidden fees, which I love. You can also count on a great value week after week. Plus, what I love is that you get these pre-portioned ingredients with every meal. They just come straight to your door. You just get it delivered, there's no hassle. You don't have to go to the grocery store. If you're like me, I grunt my way down the aisle. Groceries are so expensive nowadays. So if you want that good deal, every plate is where it's at. I just had their Super Smash Burgers. And honestly, I might be bragging here, but it was as good as a restaurant, I think. If you don't want those pre-made meals and maybe you're a little bit more of a picky eater, they cater to you. Don't worry about it. You can order off the a la carte, which is available in every plate extras. You can choose from a big lineup. Things like cherry glazed meatballs, panko crusted blue cheese chicken, and cheesecake sandwich. Basically, do whatever you want. Yeah. Save money, save time, eat better with every plate. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering code lights out 149. So in August of 1977, when Richard was 27 years old, he packed up his two rifles in his truck and he headed off to Pyramid Lake, Nevada, which was 145 miles away. And this is an indigenous American reservation. Officers from the Bureau of Indian Affairs were on patrol that day and they noticed a Ford Ranchero stuck in the sand. And when they went to check it out, they looked inside the vehicle. And that's when they noticed that there was blood across the seats and windows. They also noticed two rifles, a pile of clothes, and a bucket inside. Along with some blood, there was also what looked like organs inside the bucket. They searched the nearby area with binoculars, and that's when they spotted Richard perched on a rock about a half mile away. Richard was naked and covered in blood. They eventually tracked him down and arrested him, and Richard claimed that the blood covering his body and, and the vehicle was his own. So obviously they're like, yeah, right, we don't believe you. They booked him into jail and they actually had that blood tested as well as the organ, which ended up being a liver uh, that was found inside that bucket. And they discovered that the blood and the liver were from a cow. Supposedly, Richard had shot and killed a cow. He then shredded it, drank its blood and saved its liver for later. And again, nothing really ever comes to this. Once they discovered that it was just a cow, they're like, oh, all right, you know, you're free to leave. So they release him. They also uh, returned his vehicle to him, but they did confiscate his two rifles. So up until this point, he has only harmed animals, but police had good enough reason to suspect that Richard was prone to very gory violence. And since this happened across jurisdiction lines, Sacramento police would only know about this incident much, much later on. 
And by the end of 1977, Richard's violence would only become even more extreme. On December 27, 1977, Richard was driving around town with his brand new 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. And he drove by this woman's house in Sacramento and just decided to fire at it. Luckily, no one was harmed and police showed up not long after and found the bullet in the woman's kitchen cabinet. So he absolutely could have killed somebody that day. And I, I do feel like he was probably trying to kill her in the kitchen absolutely, and just missed. But he failed this first attempt. But two days later, he would claim his very first victim. In another drive-by, he wanted to warm up for future crimes he planned on committing. His next victim was 51-year-old Ambrose Griffin, who was an engineer and a father of two. And on December 29, 1977, he was helping his wife bring groceries into their home from the front yard. As Richard's pickup truck passed by, a crack rang out and Ambrose fell to the ground. At first, when his wife found him, she thought he had suffered from a heart attack. Ambrose was still alive, but when she saw the blood, it was obvious that he had been hit by a bullet. And sadly, Ambrose died within 15 minutes. When police investigated, Ambrose's son claimed that he saw a neighbor walking around the neighborhood with a 22 caliber rifle earlier that week. The police then went to that neighbor's house and confiscated his rifle and they conducted some ballistics tests and they determined that the rifle was not the murder weapon. But the crime lab discovered that that 22 caliber bullet that had killed Ambrose was fired from the same gun that shot, you know, that bullet into the kitchen of that Sacramento woman two days earlier. Lieutenant Ray Biondi was the chief of homicide for the sheriff's department at the time. And uh, at this point, there was no obvious suspects. You know, in that period of time, it was very difficult to solve drive-bys. There's no cameras or anything like that. So it was just based on, you know, witness testimony if anybody saw anything. But after doing a background check on Ambrose, they couldn't find any reason that someone would want to murder him. One theory the police had was that it was an accidental murder while somebody was shooting out streetlights and just vandalizing properties. So Richard was still in the clear at this point, but this was only the beginning of his killing spree. Over the next month, Richard kept newspaper clippings of his first murder, another sign of a serial killer. He's clearly proud of what he did, and his neighbors began noticing his increasingly strange behavior. On January 11th, 1978, he went over and asked his neighbor for a cigarette. When she refused to give him one, he forcibly restrained her until she gave him the entire pack. Other residents of East Sacramento began reporting a prowler going through their backyards and homes. What Richard would do is he'd just go up and down the street and just like check people's doors to see if they were locked or not, which is absolutely terrifying. So scary. And in his mind, his demented mind, he thought, if the door was locked, that means I'm not welcome. But if the door is unlocked, then that means I'm free to come inside, which is somewhat like a real vampire. For those that don't know in vampire lore, a vampire can't enter a property if they're just, they have to be welcomed inside or invited and then they can enter. Um, there's basically like this mystical protective barrier on the property until they're invited in. Um, but a part of me thinks that this was only after the fact when they started calling him the vampire of Sacramento or yeah, whatever. Yeah, I was going to say, that. is there any evidence to suggest that he thought he was a vampire? No, and I, I think it was more that like they connected the dots between him checking the doors and like mm. the invitation concept. So that might have been more of a play onto his the vampire esque side of his crimes. But at no point, I I don't think, as far as my research went, Richard believed he was a vampire. So one day, Richard walked into the home of a young married couple. While inside, he stole some of their valuables, and he urinated into a drawer of infant's clothing. He then crossed the hall and defecated on their son's bed. During the act, the couple came home and saw Richard still inside. The husband tried to attack him, but Richard escaped and ran down the street. On January 23, 1978, Richard stumbled upon a woman named Nancy Holden while wandering around a local store. He'd actually gone to high school with her, and after talking for a moment, he asked her for a ride home. I can only imagine, but at this point, Richard's not grooming himself, he's not bathing, and he's covering himself in blood, so I'm sure this guy reeks. Like I, I can't even fathom what he smells like. Horrific. And he's just, he's disheveled looking, he's got this sinister look in his eye, so Nancy's like, hell no, I'm not giving you a ride home. But... That doesn't stop Richard. He ends up following her out to the parking lot and he tries to get inside of her locked car. 
but Nancy was able to get into the driver's seat and take off before he could harm her. In his deranged state, he then wandered around the shopping center until he found a gap in the fence. And that's when he finally came across the home of David and Teresa Wallen on Tioga Way. David was a sales executive for a linen company and he had been out at Lake Tahoe. He was supposed to be back that afternoon, but his car broke down 30 miles outside of Sacramento. Teresa was three months pregnant with a baby boy that they planned on naming Dane. Richard watched as she left the house while taking out the garbage. Richard saw her walk out of the front door, meaning that the house was still unlocked. He then followed her back inside and surprised her in the hallway, where he then proceeded to shoot her three times. The first bullet went through the hand, the forearm, and the neck, which obviously is a defensive wound. She put her arm up. And then he shot her twice in the head, which killed her immediately. Richard then dragged her body to the bedroom where he proceeded to have intercourse with her corpse post-mortem and then stabbed it repeatedly with a butcher knife from the kitchen. When he was done, he then carved the corpse open and began moving her organs around with his bare hands. <sighs> it's just so sickening, including the unborn child, which was obviously now dead. Then he removed several of her internal organs and began experimenting with them. He collected some of her blood and then took it to the bathroom to bathe in it. He then sliced off one of her nipples and began drinking the blood he gathered in an empty yogurt container. Just before leaving, he went to the backyard to find a pile of dog feces. After picking it up, he returned to the house and proceeded to stuff it into her mouth and throat. David later returned home to a quiet house around 6 p.m. that evening. The stereo had been left on and a garbage bag of trash was scattered in the hallway. He thought that the dark stains on the floors were oil at first, but it only took him a few seconds to realize that it wasn't oil. It was his wife's blood. And that's when he found her body mutilated in the bedroom doorway. And this just like shakes me to my core because I'm just like, I don't even know. Can't even imagine what that must have been like that to would, come home to like, this would just be the absolute. That would ruin your life. Yeah. Your life is over at this point. Yeah. He later said, quote, I had no idea where I was or who or what I had seen. It was just beyond all comprehension. All I know is the noise I was making. I was screaming and screaming so much that my neighbors raced over to help me. Police were then immediately contacted. Rookie homicide detective Wayne Irie had only been a detective for four or five months at that time. He'd only worked misdemeanor crimes up until now, but now he was called to the scene of one of the most brutal and bloody homicides that the department ever faced. And to this day, he still remembers the look of fear across Teresa's face. Lieutenant Ray Biondi was also on the scene, and while surveying the scene, he noticed a potential calling card from the killer. It was an unexpended 22 caliber shell in the mailbox. They also noticed that the killer had worn latex gloves during the murder, and he had cleaned the murder weapon and returned it to its spot with the other kitchen knives in the dish rack. All the detectives agreed that this was one of the strangest and most brutal cases they had ever come across, and for many, it would be the strangest case of their entire careers. So officially, this crime scene was considered a disorganized murder committed by a disorganized killer. And at this time in the 70s, uh, these were fairly new terms that were being used by the FBI and behavioral science, which was now kind of coming into vogue here. And in the 70s, you know, we see a big boost in serial killers around this time. So kind of new terminology, new theories were being born and, uh, these were usually described as illogical crimes that had poor planning or no planning at all. And here's how an FBI journal published in 1985 described disorganized offenders. Quote, The disorganized offender is likely to be of below average intelligence, low birth order, and subjected to harsh parental discipline. He is in a confused and distressed state of mind at the time of the murder, is socially inadequate, and sexually incompetent. The crime scene shows that the crime was committed suddenly with no set plan of action for deterring detection. Facial destruction and sexually sadistic acts performed after the murder are typical. Disorganized offenders usually leave the victim in the same position in which he or she was killed and make no attempt to conceal the body. So we can see in this case, a lot of this description lines up with Richard Chase. I do find it's weird, though, that he cleaned that knife. Yeah, and put it back. This will uh, this will come in. Remember that because mm -hmm. this will come in. It's very to weird. play later. Yeah, um, out of all the disorganized parts of this, 
Yeah, it seems like he strategically did certain things. As disorganized as he is, he's methodical in what he's, he's doing. He's carrying out these acts. Mm -hmm. One of the main points that forensic psychologists have connected to his violent actions is, obviously, it ties back to his erectile dysfunction, which he's been plagued with since, as far as we know, since his teen years. And basically what they deduce is that he's sexually attracted to women, but he can only express this attraction through these sadistic sexual acts of violence. Um, and this isn't really unusual. If you've ever listened to serial killer cases, this is quite common. Many times the killer has no emotion at all. So they can basically much like the animals I was saying, remember you pinch the ear of a dog, it yelps. So you kind of learn not to do that. But in the serial killer's eyes, their victim is just an object. It's just this thing that he can experiment with and use as he wants, and he doesn't see it as another human life. I find it kind of odd that his first victim was a male. True. Like, if this is all a sexual thing for him, why kill Ambrose? Or was Ambrose just sort of like a test to see if he could kill? I think it or was not. more of a test. But and, and again, I think this goes back to, is this guy just completely out of his mind? Or is he capable of being calculated, pre-planning these things, and carrying it out in a, in a logical way? Because he does a drive-by, which I feel like he knew would be an easy way to kill somebody and potentially get away with it for his first, first kill, then I feel like he must have known that Teresa's husband was gone too. The fact that he just goes right in after her, I feel like he must have known that she was by herself. Scoped out the place. Yeah. And, and somehow surveilled her to, to figure that out. He is definitely aware of not getting caught. Yeah. Well, and the latex gloves too, that's a huge indicator that the, he's not just... I don't think you can just say he's just this deranged, mentally ill madman that has just like completely removed from reality. He's clearly smart enough to conduct this in a way that prevents him from leaving evidence at the scene. I think he thought the knife potentially has my DNA on it, so I'm going to clean that off. I don't know if he was thinking DNA or not, but just, you know, maybe there is something with that knife. Because he, you know, he takes the gun with him, so yeah. he's got that weapon. So he's like, "Well, I need to make sure that I clean off this other weapon that I use in this murder." It seems like he's disorganized to a point, yeah, and then he's somewhat organized, mm -hmm. which is, in my opinion, the scarier part of it. Yeah. This episode is sponsored by Care of. In case you haven't heard me talk about Care of before, it's a subscription service that ships high quality personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders conveniently to your door every month. What I really like about Care of, and I think what makes them unique is their online quiz. It's very in depth, but it doesn't take that long. And it asks you a number of different questions about your health goals, your lifestyle, and it really recommends the right vitamins and supplements for you. And what they suggest for you is a doctor backed recommendation. And then from there, you can decide what you actually want them to send you each and every month. So for me personally, I went through the quiz and it gave me a number of different vitamins like B-complex, iron, magnesium, zinc, ashwagandha, a probiotic blend, as well as vitamin D. They also have a number of protein supplements, which are really, really good. What's great about those daily vitamin packs is that they're made with plant-based composable film, which helps limit their impact on the environment without compromising on the quality and the safety of the products. It's truly a customized vitamin solution I've been taken care of, I think, for the past two years, and I've definitely felt improvements in my overall wellness. So why don't you check it out today? Because I feel like it can help you out as well. And right now we got a special offer for our listeners for 50% off your care of order. Go to takecareof.com and enter code lightsout50. You can get 50% off, folks, on your first care of order by going to takecareof.com and enter code Lights out 50. After his second murder, Richard's violence was clearly escalating. What he was once doing with animals, he was now doing with humans, except only way worse. And local investigators knew they had to act quickly and capture this guy. One of the neighbors had seen Richard near the scene of the crime and described him to police, but they couldn't put a name to the face yet. 
so Richard was still out there prowling through the neighborhood. After the horrific murder case made it to the newspapers, locals began to worry, and a lot of people bought guns you know, to protect themselves at home. Only two days after killing Teresa Wallen, Richard bought two puppies from his neighbor. He then took those dogs and shot them with his 22 pistol and then drank their blood before leaving them on a lawn near the Wallen's house. Police were able to match the 22 caliber bullets with the others found at the other crime scenes. They also noticed the dog's abdomen had been cut open and the kidneys were missing. Police figured that the killer must have lived within a one mile radius of where he dumped the carcasses. So police began canvassing the neighborhood desperately trying to find the killer, but it wasn't enough. Only four days after killing those puppies that he bought, Richard committed his most brutal murders to date. On January 27, 1978, he entered the home of 38-year-old Evelyn Maroth on Marywood Street, and he entered through the back door that was, of course, unlocked. Evelyn had been babysitting her 22-month-old nephew, David Ferreira. Her six-year-old son, Jason, was also in the home, along with her neighbor, Dan Meredith, who had come over to check on Evelyn. Evelyn was taking a bath while Dan watched the kids. As Dan stepped into the front hallway, Richard had crept into the house. At that point, he raised a 22 caliber handgun and shot Dan in the head, point blank, killing him instantly. Richard then turned over the body and stole Dan's wallet and car keys. After the gunshot, six-year-old Jason ran to his mother's bedroom. Richard then proceeded to shoot and kill 22-month-old David before chasing Jason into the bedroom and shooting him twice in the head at point blank range. Richard then ran into the bathroom and fatally shot Evelyn once in the head. After that, he dragged her corpse into the bedroom where he proceeded to sodomize her and have sex with her dead body. This was the only time that police had found evidence that Richard had orgasmed with a woman in his entire life. After that, he sliced open the neck and drank the blood. Afterward, he stabbed the corpse at least a half dozen times in the rectal area and several times in the eye. He also cut the body open and stabbed several vital points on the body, which caused the blood to pool into her abdomen. He then drained her blood into a bucket before consuming it. At the same time, one of Jason's friends, a six-year-old girl, knocked on the front door. She had a play date with Jason that day. The knock on the door spooked Richard, and he took David's corpse, the little 22-month-old, and ran out of the house and stole Dan's car in order to get home. The girl then alerted a nearby neighbor of what she saw. The neighbor then broke into the home where he discovered the bodies and called the police. The first and most obvious thing that the police noticed were perfect handprints and perfect shoe prints in Evelyn's blood. And because more 22 caliber casings were left behind, police were very confident that they were dealing with the same killer as before. Meanwhile, Richard arrived home with David's corpse. He proceeded to decapitate the corpse and consume some of the brain matter. He then cut open the corpse and consumed several internal organs raw, and with the other organs, he processed them in a blender before disposing of the corpse in a box at a nearby church. Back at the house, police wondered why 22-month-old David was nowhere to be found, so police and volunteers mobilized a massive search. As police canvassed the neighborhood, they discovered the killer had been seen by a few witnesses. Many described him as a strange-looking white male, maybe six feet tall, and wearing a bright orange parka. His hair was very scraggly and he looked emaciated. His depiction also matched the FBI's profile of the killer. He had been seen peering into people's houses earlier in the day, and now they had a solid depiction of what the suspect looked like. But they still struggled with identifying him. Plus, many men in the 70s were thin and had long, scraggly hair since the look was very popular at the time. As you can see by the sketches to the actual photo of him, it's, it's pretty close. After police released a sketch of the suspect, someone had gone to high school with Richard and recognized him. It was the same woman that had come across Richard at the store, Nancy Holden. She was so scared of him that day, she couldn't forget his face. She even mentioned the bright orange parka that the other witnesses had seen him in. When Nancy was interviewed by the police, she even admitted that she thought Richard might have had blood on his hands the day that she saw him. When police ran Richard Chase through their system, they saw his previous encounter with the police at Pyramid Lake, Nevada. They also discovered that he had recently registered 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol and found his home address. By now, detectives were convinced that Richard Chase was the killer. Wayne Irie later admitted that at the time, if he had found the baby at Richard's property, he would have shot and killed Richard on the spot. When detectives arrived at the Alpine apartment complex at 2932 Watt Avenue, 
they parked in the parking lot and contacted the manager. She confirmed that Richard was in the Evergreen Manor apartment number 15. When they knocked on Richard's apartment door, they asked to speak with him, but Richard refused. At that point, they didn't have a search warrant, so they couldn't enter. One of the detectives then put their ear against the wall and listened to Richard frantically moving around inside. Since many of the detectives were new to homicide cases, they didn't know what to do next. One detective tried contacting their supervisor and wasn't able to get through to him, and so was waiting for a return phone call. In the meantime, they hid down the hallway and waited for Richard to leave his apartment. When Richard could no longer hear them outside, he thought they had given up. When he finally came outside, he was carrying a blood-stained box full of rags. He then spotted one of the officers and began running. After a short chase, they were able to hit Richard over the head and tackle him to the ground. While they struggled with him, they noticed his gun was in a holster underneath his jacket. Detective Wayne Irie then reacted and pulled out his service revolver and pushed the barrel against Richard's head. He told him to quit fighting or he was going to quote unquote blow his brains out. Despite the threat, Richard kept struggling. And even though Wayne already had serious thoughts of killing Richard, he never pulled the trigger. He later said, I found out I'm not like him. It would have been a justified shooting. I couldn't kill him. The detectives finally got control of Richard and took him into custody. His 22 caliber pistol still covered in blood and they later matched his handgun with the bullets fired at all the murder scenes. They also discovered that he was still carrying Dan Meredith's wallet. And along with the rags, he was carrying the bucket he used to drink Evelyn's blood. After this, they were able to search his entire apartment. Inside, they found pieces of shredded, blood-soaked wallpaper and human intestines, the ceiling, floor, walls, couch, countertops, bathroom sink, and refrigerator were all covered in blood. Richard would later claim that the blood was the result of killing dogs. His blender and all of his eating and drinking utensils were also covered in blood. Inside the refrigerator, they found several animal carcasses wrapped in aluminum foil. Human brain matter was later found out to be David's which was stored in a Tupperware container, and pieces of his body were wrapped in saran wrap. The blender was still filled with organs and looked like they had been mixed with Coca-Cola. On another kitchen counter, they spotted several pet collars, and on his kitchen table, he had spread out a few diagrams depicting human biology and anatomy. Back at the stations, detectives could not get a confession from Richard or really get any information from him as far as where David was. He kept mentioning that the German Nazis or fascist Italians were out to get him, and before he said anything else, he requested an attorney. It took them almost two months to find David's remains outside of Arcade Wesleyan Church, less than a mile from Richard's apartment. A church caretaker had discovered the body in a cardboard box between two of the church buildings. The body was badly decomposed and the head had been decapitated. David was identified by the clothing that was also left in the box. And there was a ring of keys beneath the body that fit Dan's vehicle that Richard had stolen. And now they officially had six total victims. Richard Chase went on trial on January 2nd, 1979. He had dropped to 107 pounds and his eyes were sunken. And he had entered a plea of insanity. His defense attorney, Ferris Salome, later said that Richard was, quote unquote, the most deranged fellow he had ever met. Here's a clip of Ferris talking about getting Richard analyzed. Why did you resist the testing so early in the case? Well, I don't resist a testing. I would rather be the person employing the psychologist myself and obtaining the reports myself before I allow the prosecution to get into the case in that fashion. And uh, whether or not the judge is going to go along with my position or not, I will have to wait and see. Do you foresee I, that? I do foresee employing a psychologist and a psychiatrist myself and having the man examined, uh, of course, as thoroughly as we can, having in mind uh, the kind of charge it is. Prosecutor Ronald Tosherman was confident they could convince a jury that he was a killer. The evidence they had found in the apartment would have been enough, and the firearm would match the ballistics. Plus, they had found one of the victim's wallets on Richard when he was arrested. The challenge would be proving that he was legally sane when he committed the murders. During the trial, Richard admitted to his crimes, including drinking his victim's blood and decapitating the infant. He said he thought it was therapeutic. He also described himself as a quote-unquote good person, although weak in heart and mind. The defense asked for a verdict of second-degree murder to spare Richard the death penalty and get life in prison instead. The prosecution argued that he was a sexual sadist 
and a monster who knew what he was doing the entire time. On May 8, 1979, the jury found Richard Chase guilty of six counts of first-degree murder after deliberating for just five hours. Here's some brief interviews with the defense and prosecution. You must be disappointed in the verdict. Well, I don't like to discuss my personal feelings in these things. Uh, and there's not too much I could comment on. We're still in the middle of it. The jury has to come back and hear, you know, further arguments on the other issues. And uh, as far as my personal views, I think I'll just keep them personal. You're going to press for capital punishment in this case? Well, there's no secret about that. We've said from the beginning that we intend to ask for the death penalty. Nothing has changed that, nothing has happened that would cause us to change our intention uh, about the death penalty. Reading this jury now, what do you think? I'm not going to uh, comment on that either. Following the verdict, it was up to the court to figure out whether or not Richard was sane. If he was found to be insane, he would serve his sentence in a mental hospital. So to be legally insane, you essentially you can't understand the nature of your offenses and you can't understand what you've done. You can't distinguish right from wrong. Evidence that he knew right from wrong was that he hid from police and he initially denied involvement when they questioned him. Um, his defense attorney claimed that he did not know what he was doing because he was constantly running around covered in blood he was disheveled, so clearly he was just deranged. He never tried to conceal his deranged appearance, which they tried to argue was also just a part of his insanity. Which he was wearing that bright orange parka. So, I mean, not exactly trying to fly under the radar. Yeah. It was also brought up that Richard had already been held at a psychiatric facility, but was released prematurely. And around this time of this trial, several employees of that facility Richard had once stayed in back in the mid-1970s. They actually came forward and claimed that Richard should never have been discharged at all. And uh, we do have a short clip of interviews from those employees. You've said you had a very definite feeling about Rick Chase. At the time, I uh, told my immediate and distant superiors that uh, my belief was that Richard Chase now was doing uh, things with small animals, animals and birds, you know, killing them, drinking their blood, and that he would graduate to larger animal and eventually to people, unless his, you know, mental illness was checked, was treated, and it was going to take some intensive doing. It wasn't going to be done by the facilities we had there at Beverly Manor, uh, all we did was keep the man in a semblance of custody. I say semblance because the wall was only about this high in parts around Beverly Manor, and quite a few of the patients at night would go out, go over the wall, and return sometime before dawn. Now we really had no, no means of preventing this, and Richard Chase also went out at night over the wall. You know this? Yeah. One night we went out looking for him. Where did we found him someplace and brought him back? Gene, I, I've noticed you're nodding yes as Art talks. Is that the way you feel? Pretty much the same way. That he needed extensive care. It was not receiving as much care as he should have gotten or could have gotten. And the whole thing is just a tragedy. You're sending out letters now? Letters to uh, the families, the survivors? Trying to tell them how sorry we are and trying to get something done about all this. Learned that Rick Chase was leaving Beverly Manor. You tried to stop this, but what did you do? What did you, how did you try to stop? Well, I voiced my objections to the uh, then director of nurses that I didn't feel, as well as many other people, uh, members of the staff that uh, Richard was safe to be returned to society. And she didn't seem too sympathetic to that. So then I voiced my objections to everyone in hospital administration, the administrator, program director, the doctor, uh, who unfortunately I can't recall which doctor it was. And then I called the county conservator's office and uh, 
No one wanted to help them. No. Nothing they could do. No. It was just part of the, it was his turn to be released, and uh, anything that we had to say or do about it was just irrelevant. You had a feeling about Rick, didn't you? Well, yeah. A very decided feeling that he was sick and dangerous. Did you ever enter anything on any records about that? I believe I did. In, what did in you say? Medical chart. Well, as I said earlier, because of the nature, it's, you know, the way we have to write things in the charts, uh, and not be too presumptuous as to diagnose or anything of that nature. I'm not certain just how I worded it, but I got the idea across, at least I think I did, that my opinion, professional opinion, was that uh, they needed much further treatment evaluation. But that feeling... Well, when the uh, instances took place last week where the people were were, were killed, uh, and we discovered who it was, uh, I was very upset at the time Mr. Chase was released, and I was very upset when I heard what he'd done, and I didn't feel that the blame for his action rested solely with him that there were others who were in control of the situation who allowed this to happen. They were forewarned, not just by myself, but by many people at the hospital, that this guy was dangerous and shouldn't be released because he was sick. And uh, I feel that part of the blame and responsibility rests with those people who just decided to ignore. You know, we we're professional staff. We're there to do a function. We are in a hospital to take care of these people and report our findings, observations to whomever is interested. And it's on these that they're supposed to make their judgments and evaluations uh -huh. as to when they turn someone loose. Gene, Obviously, it wasn't the case. Gene, I noticed you were nodding there when he was talking about the, the laws and what have you and people. What, what do you... How do you feel about it? How do you feel about it? Just that pretty much the same thing Art said, that we wished he could have had more care and that he never should have been turned loose back into society. I don't know how to feel about that one. I mean, I think in hindsight, it would be pretty clear, like, oh, this guy was under our care. We clearly screwed up because now he's murdered six people. But do you think that's more of a hindsight thing or... That guy did seem genuine that at the time he knew there, he was potentially dangerous if released back into society. But I don't know. Do you think that's more hindsight or do you think they should have been aware? Well, I think things should have been escalated as soon as he started capturing birds from his window there and that seems like killing them and drinking their blood. Like, how do you let somebody out like that? Yeah. I don't get like, I don't know. They just gave him some medication and then. Like he was saying, it was just his turn to be released, and they didn't really consider anything beyond that. Well, the issue is, is that as soon as he was released, he stopped taking his meds. Yeah, and and I don't recall. I think there's there's some theories as to why, and his mom may even be involved with convincing him not to take it. Is something that I read. I don't know if that's true or not, but I believe that Richard right away was like i'm not taking these anymore this is making me worse i'm glad you brought up the mom too because i think you need you need family or, or friends or a loved one or something to yeah. make sh to kind of monitor you back home once you're released being like well there should be meds. follow up by the, by the whatever facility this is that there should too, be some yeah. sort of of oversight to make sure that he's continuing to, to get help outside of the institution yeah and that doesn't happen even to this day yeah. in most cases. So I think the fact he was just isolated in his own apartment and no one was really checking in on him because his parents had written him off by then wasn't, I mean, it was, he was bound to fail at some point. Yeah. As a fan of Lights Out and real life horror stories, I've got a new podcast I'd like to recommend to you that is covering exactly that, real life horror stories. This podcast comes from the director of horror films like Hostel, Cabin Fever, The Green Inferno, Knock Knock, and so much more. He's a host of two horror podcasts, and this one comes from Eli Roth from Travel Channel. It's called A Ghost Ruined My Life. What you'll hear on this podcast is real life stories of people who have been through terrifying confrontations with the unknown and come out alive 
For this podcast, Eli Roth has gone through hundreds of submissions from real people whose lives have been ravaged by ghosts, demons, or sinister entities. Each episode focuses on one person's story. It's handpicked and introduced by Eli and retold by the victims themselves. They talk about the most terrifying, unexplainable events they've ever experienced. And now you can listen to a new season of all new real life stories of terror on A Ghost Ruined My Life. Listen to A Ghost Ruined My Life with Eli Roth wherever you get your podcasts. So throughout the trial, a, about a dozen psychiatrists examined Richard and he told a few of them that he feared that his victims would possibly come back from the dead and come after him. One psychiatrist did determine that he had antisocial personality disorder on top of his old diagnosis, which was paranoid schizophrenia. But they concluded that he was aware of what he had done and that it was wrong. Some of the strongest pieces of evidence that he knew what he was doing. You already brought these up, actually. He wore latex gloves so he wouldn't leave fingerprints so he clearly understood that he's committing a crime that he's doing something wrong and he doesn't want to get caught and he cleaned off one of the murder weapons the knife that he used to stab a corpse post-mortem um and the third one yeah he didn't admit anything to police when he was first caught or even denied it right so and asked for a lawyer he knew the implications Mm -hmm. of what he had done right yeah that's kind of ironic that maybe if he you should always ask for a lawyer but if he had not asked for a lawyer and just admitted everything that might have would have proven his insanity case of like he just didn't understand what he was doing was wrong and he was completely deranged but i mean there's a lot of examples of of killers who are mentally ill that end up confessing to their crimes or just like you know they 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 want to talk about it they they want to um tell people about it yeah because it's it's this it's their reality they're completely consumed by what they what they've done but in this case it's like he knew as soon as he was arrested he was caught that it was over and that the best thing for him to do at that point would be to seek legal counsel and then plead insanity right to yep. try and get a, a lesser lesser punishment here yep so i kind of have to agree that he's likely legally sane not saying that he's not mentally ill but legally he is sane he did know what he did he was still mentally ill but we've said this so many times but just because you have a mental illness doesn't mean you're automatically you know you can just be you know be like i'm you know if i commit a crime you know i have this illness so therefore i can't be held responsible for it like mentally ill people no between right and wrong like that's yeah. you that doesn't negate that at all there are plenty of paranoid schizophrenics who go about their day Living. still understanding right and right. wrong and, and don't murder people right yeah and live totally normal lives so it's just i do think in this case he is absolutely legally sane and that's what what the court came back with and they ended up sentencing him to death by a gas chamber and while he was held on condemned row the state supreme court of california would take years to get around to his appeals And the justices had not ruled on the constitutionality of California's death penalty laws at the time. While Richard spent his time on death row, many of the other prisoners had heard about what he had done. And many inmates wanted to kill Richard, but they were too afraid to get close to him. So according to prison officials, they began convincing Richard to kill himself. Meanwhile, Richard began taking interviews with Robert Ressler, an FBI profiler and author. Richard claimed that even though he had killed, it wasn't his fault. He often brought up Nazis and UFOs, and he claimed that they forced him to kill his victims to keep himself alive. He even asked Robert if he could access a radar gun so he could apprehend these Nazi UFOs and that you know they could hold the Nazis accountable, put them on trial for the murders. During one session, he also handed Robert a large amount of macaroni and cheese he had been hiding in his pants pocket. And he told him that he believed that the prison officials were in league with the Nazis and plotting to kill him with poisoned food. But poison food wouldn't be Richard's downfall. On December 26, 1980, a prison guard was doing cell checks when he found Richard lying awkwardly in his bed and he wasn't breathing. An autopsy determined that Richard had committed suicide with an overdose of doxepin that he had saved up over the past few weeks, which this medication was prescribed for his depression. The prison psychiatrist later noted that Richard had been psychotic from the moment he entered the prison and no one really bothered to deal with his bizarre obsession with blood. So that is the the end of this monster's absolutely disturbing life. I think also our 
And this is such an insane case, but I feel like now our true crime literacy just across the board is so much better now that we we know, okay, like a 10-year-old killing cats, boom, clearly something wrong, and we need to monitor this person for quite a while and make sure that they're continuously taking medication or whatever they need to not do that any longer. Well, you should have gotten help at 10 years old. Yeah. And been, you know, treated from that early of an age that perhaps maybe could have set him on a different track. But again, different time, didn't have the support from from his mom. And so he just was like on his own. So like in that sense, I do think that not only did his mom fail him, but the system failed him. And for that, it's not necessarily his fault that he didn't get the help that he needed from an early age. But with that being said, it doesn't excuse anything that he did. Right. And obviously mental illness plays a huge part in this one. But ultimately, I, I do believe that he knew what he was doing was wrong. And he just couldn't, the, the drive to kill, the cravings for blood were just, he truly believed that that was something that he needed. But it's like, this is a very tricky one because I think there's multiple factors going on here that contribute to to his crimes. I think it starts out being this obsession with blood, and he and he feels that he the blood is needed in order to fuel him and keep him alive and and allow him to be sexually competent. And you know that's the primary reason for doing it at the beginning, but then it takes a dark turn when he starts experimenting with. The killing of animals and it's not like he's humanely killing animals and then you know just taking the blood and burying them and moving on no he's mutilating them and so things take a dark turn when he suddenly realizes that oh wow i'm able to get aroused by being violent with with these you know dead animals and ultimately humans and so i think it's an evolution that happens here and that perhaps had it been checked in that early early stage that maybe they might have been able to put him on the right path and also treat him for that you know schizophrenia when that started showing its face later on but i agree that they could have nipped it in the bud and i also think that this is why calling him the vampire of sacramento or whatever is kind of doing this whole case it's some injustice because it wasn't it's not just about blood you know vampires are just about drinking Mm -hmm. blood obviously that comes with killing some of their victims but clearly richard was in it for something else it wasn't it escalated like you were saying from blood into consuming animal parts into consuming humans so it wasn't just about the blood and this might be a controversial take but really if it was just about blood there are so many ways to not ethically get blood but let's say you just had some something off about you and you just needed to consume human blood for whatever however you convince yourself of that there are so many better ways of doing that i'm not saying anybody should be doing that. like break into a blood bank yeah exactly Steal a bunch of bags of blood yeah or bribe bribe the blood bank guy and you know give him a thousand dollars like have you there's this movie uh only lovers left alive by jim jarmusch They have these like blood hookups and they're like bribing hospital staff of like giving them blood. There's plenty of ways you can just get human blood without... Or just consensually get it from somebody who's willing to give it to you. Right. There's whole groups of people that do this. Absolutely. And so that do blood ceremonies and stuff or, you know, believe in bloodletting and and things like that. So he could have found that avenue where it wouldn't have ever turned into a criminal act. And yet that's not what happens at all yeah this isn't about blood at at a certain point it goes way far beyond that Mm -hmm. and then the fact that he seeks out information on the hillside stranglers and he's reading into depth uh very dark evil crimes and and killings and i think that at some point flips something on for him and he is getting excited about the idea of doing what these guys did and i think that's where you have to wonder it's like that's a that's a logical decision to make to be like oh i want to experience what these guys did and so therefore i'm going to graduate from animals and go to humans 
And I think one of the biggest pieces of evidence for him being legally sane is the fact that he kills Ambrose and he's he's like, okay, we're gonna I'm gonna start out. You know, if he was truly, you know, just out of his mind, psychotic, just completely going nuts, he would have just like ran in somewhere and just like murdered, you know, just murdered everybody, just as we've seen with other killers where it's just there's it doesn't matter if it's male female it's just like whoever's available i'm just gonna i'm gonna murder them and 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 mutilate them but he try it's almost like he tries things out for the first time and the fact he didn't take ambrose with him he just kills ambrose and then moves on and it's like he's just testing out his weapon he's making sure that he can shoot his gun and kill somebody with it before he moves on to a more intimate killing so to me i see a a logical progression with this killer i see him graduate from one step to the next to the to the point where he's just he's completely gone you know all in on it yeah um especially when talking about david the infant and stuff it's just he's evil i mean he's just let that evil escalate and ultimately he's he's getting off on it yeah i I do want to crack open a little jar of worms here I think it's hard to not shy away from this fact is that after he was released from the psychiatric hospital, he goes and buys a firearm. Mm. And I think, I think, yes, he would have still probably found a way to kill people. Um, maybe not to the extent that he did, because clearly it's way easier to walk into a house and just start gunning people down than it is if you had, if you were wielding a knife or something like that. So I think at least just to address that, because I don't want to skimp over that. I know it's a touchy subject, especially among Americans of, you know, Second Amendment rights and whatnot. But I do find it problematic that this guy is clearly tearing heads off birds and syringing blood out of dogs and and then consuming animals. And then he's buying firearms, I think, is clearly a problem. And uh, now... I don't know exactly how we have to address these things, but if you can't acknowledge that that's a problem within this case, I don't know what to tell you because that's disturbing to me that yeah, he could yeah. just roll in. And his two rifles were confiscated by another police, but you know there was a problem with jurisdictions and Sacramento police didn't even know about that crime until after they had looked him up in their database. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was also a problem as well. Um, just the lack of... I guess transparency across jurisdictions, a lack of record keeping, and a lack of accountability for people purchasing firearms like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's why there's you know there's starting to be changes made. I know here in Colorado, I forget what the the name of the the law is exactly, but there's like red flags where you can, you know, de depending on your you know, mental stability, things like that, the court can. Uh, confiscate your your weapons yeah that was earlier um, this year right? yeah, yeah i'm pretty sure yeah i'm trying to i'm trying to remember what that's called but um we're starting to see that more and more i think the the fact that he chose a pistol as his murder weapon also speaks to the level at which he thought things out because in my mind i'm thinking this guy's a really scrawny small dude emaciated emaciated he probably knew that he's not going to be able to tussle with anybody so he's not going to take the approach that say like btk did or some of the other serial killers out there where it's you know they're strangling people they're you know using ligatures things like that to to murder their victims that he knew he's like well i'm i'm screwed if i can't can't get this done so he purposely chose the firearm because of that yeah and, and the, the, his male victims were either killed first right from a distance or weren't even at the crime scene at all it was only right. women or infants you know yeah i just think there's enough choices that he made throughout his crimes to speak to the fact that he was legally sane as insane as he is mentally and he's got a lot i mean there's a lot going on there i do think that he was legally sane enough to get the punishment that he did yeah he was clearly strategizing, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. So I'm glad this guy is not uh, alive anymore, that's for sure. He's truly one of the most evil individuals I've ever heard of.
and man, I just can't even fathom what what the victims' families. How do you even like? There's no way to come back from this. Like, how do you even move on when your loved ones were absolutely brutalized, like they were, and your young child, your pregnant wife, your 22 month old infant? It's just it's unfathomable the pain and suffering that they they've had to go through as a result of of Richard and for from what I do know David did move on um I I believe he remarried and had a daughter actually uh, at some point that's good so yeah. yeah I hope he's doing well I mean just the trauma from that is just I don't know how you'd ever get over that it's just uh, it makes me sick even thinking about it yeah but with that being said I think we're going to go on to wrap up today's episode there do you have any Final thoughts there, Daniel, before we leave. I don't mean to open up a can of worms, kind of like Austin, but um, I think we're kind of glancing over his drug abuse as a kid, too, mm. because if he was heavily abusing hallucinogens, I think that exacerbated his mental illness 100%. far beyond what it normally would have been. I think that really is what drove him. I mean, for a modern day example of what hallucinogen abuse can do to someone, have you guys ever heard of Connor Murphy, the uh, fitness YouTuber? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a that's a whole can of worms on its own. But essentially, he started abusing hallucinogens, and he, I don't want to say he went clinically insane, but he he went off the rails. And fortunately, he's he's gotten himself back now. But he went absolutely crazy. It's it's a very interesting story, and there's a there's a very interesting YouTube video about it. But it, it kind of proves that hallucinogens can take a normal person and make them go crazy. So what can it do to someone who already has a baseline of severe yeah, mental illness? Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, yeah. I think that was an accelerant. Definitely. For him, for sure. I know that forensic psychologist we mentioned earlier, yeah. she agreed that it, even though it did not cause it, it definitely probably fueled the fire for that early on. And I can only imagine, too, the psychiatric facility probably didn't have a whole lot of understanding or experience with these substances, so they don't really know how they interact. And True. You know, they probably didn't even know that by abusing those at a young age that it was affecting his brain the way that it was. and. So it's just, I think there was just su such a lack of knowledge around the brain and mental health at that time that they're just, you know, let's throw a, another drug at it and see see what sticks and and try to try to find some way to to help him um, get better. But ultimately, nothing worked. But yeah, that was a, that was a great great point there, Daniel. But uh, but yeah, we're gonna wrap up today's episode there. Let us know your thoughts in the comments if you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching or listening elsewhere. Come join us over on YouTube. Uh, lots of conversation there or on social media. That lights out cast. But we'll see you guys next week with another one. And until then, lights out, everybody.